The sermons in last week's services were designed to lay groundwork, although they stood also on their own, for what I intend to finish this afternoon. Regarding, first of all, last Sunday morning, the teaching of the New Testament concerning the cost of discipleship. Then we noticed in the afternoon how that the Lord's church is the army of the Lord, an advancing army. Now those two were presented not just because of the truth they teach and thus they stand on their own for that. But I wanted them to be presented as to reminding us why Christians are persecuted. Christ warned us about that as he taught in his earthly ministry, as Matthew, Mark, and Luke, John teaches, that we must be willing to lay down our lives and give up anything or everything or take upon ourselves whatever is necessary to be obedient to him. And that when we do that, then we are in effect taking up our cross daily to follow him. We concluded that a religion that is worth nothing costs nothing. And so that is regarding your own personal relationship to God. Remember that Acts 20 and verse 28 teaches us that God purchased the church with his son's blood. And we conclude from that, the church is worth the purchase price. But the church is made of individual Christians who heard, believed, and obeyed the gospel. And as penitent believers were baptized into Christ for the remission of their sins. In the afternoon, we pointed out that those who are dedicated that way immensely and continually, steadfastly to the truth of God concerning the cost of discipleship, being members of the spiritual body of Christ, are always taking seriously what the Lord said of uh, being a soldier in the army of the Lord in preaching the gospel and defending the faith but knowing all the time that when you do that those who hate God and hate Christ and hate the gospel hate the Bible are going to hate the products of the Bible which are Christians and I use that word Christian as it's used and defined in the New Testament so I wanted to remind ourselves of that before we get around to dealing more specifically with some of that this afternoon. And this morning's lesson ties in really with both of those. And so I'm kind of having it as a transition message. It stands on its own, but also leading up to this afternoon's lesson that we'll hopefully for now uh, deal more specifically with where we are today as Christians in this country. And what is going on, what has gone on, but especially what may go on regarding opposition to true Christianity, primitive, pure New Testament Christianity. The distinctive, underscore that, the distinctive nature of Christianity in the first century, which we see in the New Testament, is carefully reflected in Acts chapter 28 and verse 22. Paul was part of a sterling church. The word church coming from a compound Greek word, ekklesia, which putting both of those together means the called out, the gospel, God's power to save us, Romans 1.16. That Christ said it's to be preached to every creature, Mark 16.15. It's what calls every person out of service to sin and self and the world. Paul was a member of that church. But the Jews who didn't believe considered it the sect everywhere spoken against. Now again, let me remind you, and we'll talk about that more this afternoon, the Lord willing, that the blessings of peace that Christians have known in this country has primarily been because of the rights under the Constitution that we enjoy. 
and all laws derived therefrom must harmonize with those rights guaranteed to us. And that's in the very First Amendment to the Constitution of what Congress is not to do concerning religion and the free exercise thereof. We need to remember that, and as I say, I'll try to refer to that this afternoon more in that part of this sermon concerning facing persecution as Christians. But how would you like to be today where everybody, your neighbors, the government, everybody, considered you to be a part of a religious institution that was abhorred, hated, and everywhere they speak against it. And it's not only just words of criticism, harsh criticism against you as a Christian and as the church of which you are a member, but all kinds of false charges brought against you. It's obvious in everyday concourse of life that tail-bearing and gossip takes place on matters having nothing to do with morals or religion. But people just see something and they assume a whole lot and they say, well, this is what happened when it didn't. But it suits their purpose to tell it because they don't care anything about it anyway and that's just soon to be put down. This is just another opportunity to be able to do it. Well, the church faced that. But now remember, in that day when the New Testament was being revealed, when the Lord's church was new, the majority of the world was strictly idolatrous. They had no background in the Old Testament, and certainly they knew nothing about New Testament Christianity. Those that had any kind of connection were the Jews, and they were such a small minority in the Roman Empire. And they are the first ones that persecuted the church. Just read the book of Acts. Of course, they put Jesus to death. So we must remember that in that day and time was not like today where you have Protestant denominationalism, where you have Roman Catholicism, Eastern Orthodox and certain other things that pertain to God and Christ and the Bible but are not true to the truth of God's Word. But you just had one church. Then there was all the rest of this stuff and that's what people were used to. They were just as used to all that idolater stuff and the immorality of it as we are to drinking water. Now, that may sound <laughs> extreme, but that's right. They knew nothing about it. You couldn't go up to them and talk about them about the Bible, about anything. They didn't know it. It wasn't in their, in their background. For generations, it had not been in their background. Read Romans chapter 1 and see how the Gentiles got to where they were by the first century. And Paul tells us they desired not to retain God in their knowledge long before the first century. And because as free moral agents, they chose to reject God. God gave them over to doing as they pleased. And thus they developed all the immoralities that were characteristic of the idolatrous worship of that time. So if you were a Christian in the first century... People didn't know what you were. And you know, people are extremely suspicious of things they are not familiar with. We all like to do things routinely, and when there's a change of the routine, we sort of don't like that ourselves. But when it comes to something like this, and then all the rumors and false teaching that went out about what they were, later on, because of the teaching concerning the Lord's Supper, they actually accused Christians of cannibalism. And you see how the Jews misunderstood it when the Lord first talked about, not the Lord's Supper, but talked about receiving Him as the only Savior, that He was the bread which came down from heaven. And you must take that bread in. Well, they just couldn't think of anything but eating His body or drinking His actual blood. So I say again, as we preached a few weeks ago, that had nothing to do with the Lord's Supper. It's talking about accepting Christ as the Messiah, the Son of God. And they didn't. So you've always got to be mindful of disparaging and dissolving people's misconceptions of things. 
Notice also that when the gospel began to get out into the Roman world, that Paul said that the faithful servants of Christ, members of the Lord's church, he said that to a Gentile church, 1 Corinthians. And then in 1 Corinthians 4, in verse 13, the Christians were considered the filth of the world, the off-scouring of all things. Things like that be said about you, and your neighbors think that about you. And treat you accordingly. But that was the church of the first century. Then following the lowly and meek Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, was not a popular thing. It was not an easy road. And that's why I delivered what I did last week about the cost of discipleship. Paul made that clear in writing to the churches of Galatia in Galatians 1 and verse 10. And our Lord in His teaching while He was on earth, as we studied last week, Matthew 7 and 14. Now again, I don't know why we're this way, but it's in our nature, our human nature, to tag people we don't like with names that disparage a cause with which we cannot feel comfortable. We do that all the time. It's readily done all around us in politics and in various ways. So what does that mean? It means that enemies of the gospel system referred to the disciples of our Savior, as I said earlier, as a sect. And you know, people today who claim to believe in Christ and the Bible is the Word of God, and God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, they claim to be loyal to Him, will still think that sectarianism, denominationalism, is acceptable to God when there's not a word in the New Testament that in just so many words explicitly or by implication justifies the division of denominationalism. It's just not there. John 17, 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10, in fact, Verse 10 of 1 Corinthians 1 condemns it. God expects His people to all be one under the authority of Christ, to believe and practice the same things concerning what one must do to be saved and what one must do in the worship of Him and in daily Christian living. There's one thing for sure. Christians of the first century made a great impact on the Roman society. Now, once the church began to apostatize toward the end of the first century, and then it really continued to build on that apostasy with more compromise for the next two or three centuries. But one of the things that they continued to hold to was that there was one God, one Father, and one Lord Jesus Christ, and one church. Though there were lots of false doctrines floating around, you can see the beginning of those false doctrines refuted even in the writing of the New Testament and the warnings to Christians not to be caught up in anything that was contrary to sound doctrine. But the thing that really comes out about all of that is to notice if you read any literature outside the New Testament, and you don't need to to get the point, is that they continued, even to the writing to the Caesars, of a defense of the existence of Christ and who he was and what they were. And it gets interesting, if you're a student of history, it's interesting to read over the two centuries after the first century how that these people did that. They saw the need to do it. And thus we see taught in the New Testament by use of a word that does get used quite a bit today in those who would prove the existence of God and refute atheism and who seek to uphold the deity of Christ and the inspiration of the scriptures to apologetics coming from the Greek word apologia to give an answer, to make a defense. They saw the need to do that. And so they further disrupted the old order of paganism by their willingness to do that. And yet many times at great expense to themselves personally, to their families, to their friends who are all members of the Lord's church, they suffered greatly. 
Today, some churches stand for so little, they're, they're never noticed. Have you thought about that? If you don't watch out, you will equate faithfulness with simply being never noticed. I'm not bothered. I try to pursue a course to where I will, I will just not be noticed and nobody will ever get upset at me. Well, let me ask you this. A cursory reading of the New Testament and the lives of faithful Christians, do you see that exemplified in them? And above all, do you see that exemplified in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the head of the church and the one who died for us? There are some today who are so weak, they just blend into the panoply of earthly matters. And if anybody around them, brothers and sisters in Christ, who stand up and advocate the truth, and in advocating that absolute objective truth on whatever point it is, they expose that which is contrary to it, then you become the bad guy. You become the bad guy. So no persecution ever comes to them for they're simply not living godly lives. They're not godly enough, in other words, to bring out the wrath of Satan's servant. Because I promise you, Satan will not leave you alone if you love the truth supremely, you love God with all your heart, your neighbors, yourself, you love your brethren, and you love the truth. And you want to live it, and you know without that truth, people cannot be saved. And when you see people advocating things contrary to that truth, you can't be quiet. Look at the attitude of Paul when he walked among the idolaters on Mars Hill in Athens. He saw the city wholly given to idolatry. And it says his spirit was stirred within him. I suggest you, a great many of us today, can walk around and look at all this mess going on over the news or everything else that's ungodly. It doesn't bother us at all. And we sit back and say, well, I'm glad I'm not a part of that. Well, maybe we should be. We're the leavening of good in the world. We're the light of the world. We're the salt of the earth. How do we do that? We're seeking to change others to belief and obedience to the gospel and steadfast living in the church. Yeah, that caused me to lose my job. That caused me my neighbors not like me. That caused me to this, that, and the other. So, don't forget everything we studied last week. And that came directly from the Bible on the cost of being a disciple of the Lord. In other words, if you are what you ought to be before God as a member of the church, we bring, not because that's what we want, but we know to expect it. We bring persecution upon ourselves. Just like those in Jerusalem saved the apostles at the persecution that arose after the death of the first Christian martyr, Stephen, brethren had to flee. We'll talk about that more this afternoon. But they went everywhere preaching the word. That's what got them in the trouble. Don't you, don't you learn to leave well enough alone? That's what we would tell somebody. Raising a child or something. Haven't you learned by now not to do that? Well, there's a lot of people in the church that says, just don't bother people. One of my early recollections in my first full-time work, there was a lady who was roughly, at that time, over 50 years ago, my age today. She might not have been quite as old, but she was in her 70s. And I dealt with a false religious doctrine and called it and dealt with it. And when she came out that day, she very matter-of-factly said, why don't you just preach the gospel and leave everybody else alone? Now that was before people who advocated false doctrine permeated the church throughout the country, as it is today. And you didn't have secularism, materialism running everybody down and I don't careism and leave me alone and we're here to entertain ourselves and not God and all that. She didn't realize what she implied. The gospel does not leave people alone. The truth of God's word does not sit by while error is taught and people practice that. That will only send people to torment when they die. Christians love the souls of men, women, boys and girls. They know that all is sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. And they know the wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23. 
and they love souls like God did, and they want to see people called out of that mess. There's only one thing that can do that, and that's the gospel of Jesus Christ, God's power unto salvation, Romans 1, 16. That's why Christ said to you and to me and to the church everywhere, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, Romans, um, rather, Mark 16, 15. It's the power of God to save, Romans 1, 16. So, we're back to what we mentioned last week in 2 Timothy 3.12. We'll probably mention it again. All that will live godly. Now notice will. You must want to. You have the power to. You don't have to. You can will to do otherwise. You can will to be ungodly. You can will to live contrary to the truth. But all who will live godly or who that will godly live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. 2 Timothy 3.12. So when I see uh, churches operate and individual Christians conduct themselves in a way that gives advantage to Satan. Now, I want you to think about that. Let me give you a good rule of Bible interpretation. In other words, in trying to understand what God put in the Bible that we need to know and must know to be saved. Let me give you a good rule of guidance. If you conclude from a passage a meaning that when you really look at it honestly, it gives Satan an advantage in your life or others, you got the wrong interpretation. You may not have the right, but when you do that, and we don't want to do that. Can you imagine a Christian, one who is of Christ for such it means, wanting to give Satan the advantage? But when you take the attitude, leave everybody alone. Don't get upset with me. That's what you're doing. I know some churches want to be known as faithful to God, but yet they, they seek the applause of temporal powers, and they get them by their social stuff that they do that really has nothing to do with aiming at the soul and spiritual matters. They're just aiming at the flesh and taking care of it. Now, I'm not opposed to the teaching of the Bible on the benevolent activities of the church. But the social gospel says that's all there is to it. You're a faithful child of God if you clothe people. You're a faithful child of God if you feed people. But don't you ever point out to them that their beliefs and their doctrines can cause them to lose their soul. In other words, Christianity is just simply tending to the fleshly, tending to the material. The benevolent teaching of the New Testament concerning the, the church and what it's to do in that area means that here's people who can't help themselves. They have nobody else to help them. And we show the love of God and care for them to get their attention regarding their souls. Because you see, all of the things we might do to help the body all the things we might do must come to an end. It all comes to an end someday at the end of the world when the elements melt with fervent heat, the earth also and the works that are therein are burned up. We're seeking that which is not material, that which we know will continue on and on and on and never cease. And there's only two places in eternity, finally and ultimately, that one may go, and that's to heaven or to hell. That's it. Everybody in this room, everybody in this county, everybody in the state and the country and the world are headed to one of two places, hell or heaven. And the Lord's church understands very, 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 very few are headed for heaven that are accountable to God for their actions. We're not talking about innocent people and people not accountable to God and it's no fault of their own. We're talking about people who are accountable to God for what they think, say, and do and don't do. They must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account of the deeds done in the body, Paul says, whether good or bad. Let me mention this. I may have cause to go back to it sometime if I deliver a whole sermon on the judgment. Everybody will be at the judgment. It's a crowd, a crowd you know it. That couldn't happen as things now stand in the material world, the laws of physics and so on. But remember, all that's gone. So you're not going to be governed by hours and minutes and space and all that. But it's going to be one of the most lonely 
places, if not the most lonely place. I think I say the most lonely place an individual can ever be. Why? Because you will personally and all by yourself stand before your Lord and give an account of your life on earth. And whatever forgetteries we have as human beings due to age or whatever the reason here, you won't forget a thing. It's all there. Do you remember Abraham speaking to the rich man who's lost in Luke 16? And he's warning Abraham to send Lazarus over with his finger dipped in water and touch it to his tongue for he's tormented in that flame. Do you remember how when Lazarus said, no, there's a, or rather Abraham said, there's a great gulf fixed between us and you. You can't come over here. We can't come over there. And then he wanted Abraham to send Lazarus back from the dead because he had five brethren that were still living on this earth. They could still do something about their life so that they would testify, so that he would testify to them that they not come to that place where he was now being tormented in the fire. Do you remember in that whole thing, the thing that really gets, well, there's several things that would grab your attention, but one of them is the simple thing that son, Abraham says to him, remember. Remember that thy and thy lifetimes had thou your good things and Lazarus' evil things. Now he's comforted and thou art tormented. And then he tells them that though one rose from the dead, that wouldn't guarantee that they would repent and change. In fact, being that they lived and died as the Lord presented it under the law of Moses as Jews, that was the way at that time they approached God. That Abraham tells them they have Moses and the prophets. Let them, his brethren, hear them. Not so, he said. He still carried that old rebellious character that the Word of God didn't make any difference to him. And there he is tormented because it didn't make any difference to him here. The early church knew and they were reminded that the friendship of the world is enmity, meaning hate, with God. James 4 and verse 4. Now we spent some time with the study of John we missed due to the hurricane this past week but we left off emphasizing and we've done it all the time there's a reason there's a reason John wrote it in the first place love not the world neither the things that are in the world if any man love the world the love of the father is not in him for all that is in the world the lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes the pride of life is of the world and the world passeth away and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Think the early church believed that? John says, I'm writing this to you so your joy will be full and you'll have the same fellowship with God that the apostles have with God. That's necessary then to know that. James echoed it in James 4 and verse 4 that I just noticed. The powerful words of the Redeemer should still be ringing in the faithful child of God's ears in Luke 6, 26. Woe, W-O-E, unto you when all men speak well of you. It then goes ahead to say, for so did their fathers unto the false prophets. There are people who love smooth things. That is, it allows them to do as they please regardless of what the Word of God teaches they ought to do or not do. And yet they still want to think that we're all right with God. We've got to be careful of that. We've got to know that when we go out as Lord's a dancing army, considering the cost of being a faithful disciple, there are going to be people, though, who even in the church don't want to hear that. Truth will always be controversial. It's the nature of it. Now, I know this pulpit is made out of wood products now, I don't know all about it but I know that much because I know what wood is and I can find out now if we want to really go into all sorts of whatever we can find out I think it's oak but let's just say it is it's oak wood may not be but I'm saying it is right now for illustration purposes now somebody says, says no that's plastic no that's some sort of acrylic 
Or somebody else may say, you just think there's a pulpit there. There's really not. <laughs> All that's out there today when it comes to what the Bible teaches. But truth is just what it is. It's absolute and objective. It doesn't make a difference what race you are, ethnicity, wealthy or not, male or female. It's just what it is. Now we bring that down to our day and time. And people have just all over the place been foiled by the devil and being deceived to saying it doesn't make any difference what you believe religion just so you're sincere. Failing to realize you can be sincerely wrong and think you're right. For there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Well, the honest hearted person understanding the nature of truth knows that whatever truth it is, it's absolute and objective. It doesn't change according to my likes and dislikes and viewpoints. Now, in our day and time, you, you see people saying, well, I was biologically born a male, or I was biologically born a female. Now, I'm going to identify with a butterfly. You know, if you're going to go to extremes, why say you want to identify as a as a biological male with a female. Why don't you just want to identify the butterfly? Why don't you want to identify with anything else? And because in your mind you identified with it, those thoughts were there, that made you what it was. That doesn't make any sense. It goes against the way you're put together, the way you think. So we find that the Bible addresses that in Genesis then Jesus reminds us of it in Matthew 19. In the beginning, God created us, humankind, male and female. Yeah, but I don't know. Male and female. Well, I'm identifying as a terrapin. No, I don't care. That means your mind's off. You need help. Male and female. Now, we... We must realize that on something as basic and fundamental and foundational as that is regarding humankind, people can get upset with you over that. Nevertheless, the church has the obligation to uphold the truth. And that's part of New Testament truth and Bible truth that he made mankind male and female. I don't accept that. I don't care if you don't accept it. The Bible being the word of God, there's no other kind of human than male or female. And you just apply that on down to so many things. It doesn't make a difference. You can think yourself, well, I've got a, I've got a medical degree. What medical school did you go to? Well, I didn't go to medical school. But I've identified as a medical doctor. Well, there may be something like that around. But nevertheless, <laughs> the point is, that doesn't make you have what it, you must have in knowledge and qualification to be a medical doctor. Anybody can call himself anything, but then you are. We in the church today need to start with that fundamental thing in teaching people. You may go out here to teach somebody the gospel and find out they have imbibed that stuff due to several generations of being removed from God and the Bible and a proper division of it, and you may have to deal with that. What are you going to do about it? One thing I would say in passing on that, the DNA states the truth and it doesn't lie. You can in your mind think you're a fence post or you're a bunny rabbit or a male biologically, a female and vice versa. But you check the DNA and you can be carved up by surgeons and undergone all sorts of psychological treatment to make you a woman if you're a biological man. And when you get through, they test the DNA. And it'll say male or female as the case might be. Now the church needs to stand up for that kind of thing. Overall, we're not used to doing that. But that's the truth of God's word too. Just like as Jesus in Matthew 19 does, he goes on into even teaching what a scriptural marriage is and what a scriptural divorce is. We've got to uphold that. You know that every, for some years now, every other marriage ends in divorce. 
Now, the church in this world living like the Bible says, we go out to preach the gospel. What do you think we're going to find when we go to the study with somebody? Well, every other one <laughs> may be in marriage is contrary to God's truth. Then you got people that won't marry, don't see any use in it, don't believe in it. Well, what are we going to do? It never hurts just to state what the Bible states. Until you prove this Bible not to be the infallible, inerrant, all-sufficient, final and complete revelation of God to man to guide him from here to heaven, it says male and female, he created he them. And he talks about marriage between a man and a woman. Yeah, but I don't believe that. I don't care whether you believe it or not. That's what the book says. Now, disprove the book to be the Word of God. Are we ready to do that? That's what you'd have to do. It's to show that this Bible is not the Word of God. Well, Paul said to Timothy, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, which means complete, truly furnished unto every good work. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Brethren, sometimes we think, we don't realize Man is made by God, and so he gave, gave us his word for man. They're meant to come together. Sometimes just the actual statement of the truth of the Bible shakes some people up because they haven't heard it. They don't know what's in that book. I went back through this past week, started listening. This took place in 78, I think, down in Tampa, Florida. And Brother Warren debated the second atheist that he, the late Brother Warren, debated, Wallace I. Matson from the University of California. The first thing Matson did when he got in the, in the pulpit said, well, I don't know much about this book, but I think somewhere St. Paul said such and such, as he put it. He said, I think that's right. Well, what that person needs is a good dose of here's what it actually says. Now, what does it mean to you? Well, he may say, I don't believe in it. All right, show me the reasons it's not the Word of God. We've got to be able to do that. Be ready to give an answer to every man, a reason of the hope that is within you with meekness and fear. We've got to be ready to do it. Most of the time we've taken that in the church and dealt with it from the standpoint of denominational errors. But this gets right down to the very fundamentals of humankind. We have to do that. You see some of these churches over the years saying, well, we sent our church staff over to hear this denominational preacher do such and so. What do I need? What can I learn? from people who don't even know the plan of salvation and won't believe it and obey it. It's going to help me serve God faithfully. Because that shows you how far down the road people can get. The scriptures are, Acts 17 11, would be far better to understand the distinctiveness and plainness of the identifying marks of the Lord's church and the plan of salvation. Now I want to close with this. Christianity is not a game for sissies. It's not pickleball, which seems to be the craze around nowadays. When you, and some of you weren't here, but you go back and listen to it on YouTube if you wanted to, but you know it if you know anything about the Bible, it takes a strong person through every day of their life to be a faithful member of the church of our Lord, to be a true Christian. It takes courage to stand alone in the midst of all kinds of professional, social climbing and in the maze of how to win friends and influence people. Really, they have a mind not disturbing anybody. But our great example, 1 Peter 2 and 21, warned that the world would not love us. Jesus taught that in John 15. 19, all the way through that conversation, he had an intimate conversation with his apostles regarding his leaving and what they were going to do and what he called them to do, down through 16, 2. So we must always be set for the defense of the gospel, Philippians 1, 17. As we openly speak of what Luke talks about in Acts 17, 3, the way of righteousness for which we are to contend, Jude verse 3. Do you remember the Old Testament worthies who were blessed by God, never having known the gospel of the church, but were faithful in their day to God's will? Joseph, 
Daniel, Joshua, and then out of the New Testament, Stephen, and the apostles in general. Look at how they individually stood for the truth no matter what came upon them and no matter the pain, the anguish, the persecution, and privation. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus made it clear when he reminded his disciples that tribulation would attend their pilgrimage on this earth. And he did it this way because they were familiar, very familiar with the Old Testament situation. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Stephen even said that in the sermon before they stoned him to death for preaching the truth to them because he loved them more than they loved themselves. Which of the prophets have you not persecuted? So to ignore such prominence prominent Bible passages is to show really where our lack of faith is, our lack of zeal, our lack of love. We can call ourselves great and wonderful servants of God, but if we're trying to get through life with as little problems as we can, that's going to take us down a road. It's going to lead us to the point where we won't even stand up and say water's wet for fear somebody will contradict us. We are people of the truth and the love of God with all that we are and have, the love of our brethren, we must realize we're to love the truth. Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed and ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. John 8, 31 and 32. That'll be true all the way down through time in every circumstance. Jesus prayed, Father, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth, John 17, 17. The sword of the Spirit is the word of God, Ephesians 6, 17. It's the seed of the kingdom, Luke 8, 11. And Paul said to Timothy, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But they shall heap unto themselves teachers having itching ears and shall be turned away from the truth unto fables. Watch thou in all things. Make full proof of thy ministry. Well, yeah, that's said to a preacher. Well, according to your several abilities and place in the church, you are a teacher of truth and the truth brought to you where you are if you're a Christian. And if you ever become a Christian, it will be the truth of the gospel that brings you to that by your full acceptance and belief and obedience to it. And if you ever cease to be faithful, it will be by giving up that truth and going contrary to it to do as you please. Are you a member of the church? Are you a Christian? Are you willing to stand for Christ and bear your cross? If so, believe that Christ is the Son of God. Repent of your sins. Confess your faith in Him. And be buried with your Lord in baptism to obtain the remission of sins. As a child of God, are we faithful? Are we doing our part? Is God well pleased with us by the way we live and what we say and do and so on? We need to use every opportunity, wherever we are, on the job or anywhere else, to be a godly person in life and practice and in our teaching. If you need to repent of any sins as a child of God, may the words of this sermon and may the words of the song 